Yes. 
I'm an advocate of the High Court of Kenya, uh, practicing in Nairobi and other courts out of Nairobi. And um, the purpose of, um, of today's uh, engagement uh, with you is um, to have a small uh, talk on the law of succession. And um, basically the law of succession is uh, the law that is in our statutes that guides what happens to the property of uh, any Kenyan once they pass on and uh, the modalities that ensure that uh, uh, the right thing is done with regard to his estate. Estate here meaning the property of a deceased person. Um, we are doing this um, as part of the legal week of Kahawa Farmers Church uh, so that uh, we try and uh, ensure that um, even as we fight with this COVID uh, disaster that is with us, life has to continue and uh, people have to be informed because there is still life after Corona. Now, I'll try to ensure that I don't go into a lot of details on legal matters because I need to caution the audience that uh, this is not a specifically legal advice to your specific case. This is more of... Um, an overview to give you um, a rough idea about what to expect in case of a loved one passing on or in case you, you, you are to pass on yourself, what happens and what the law expects. Um, in a nutshell, um, we have uh, two types of situations once somebody passes on. Uh, one is a situation whereby the person uh, had... Uh, had decided before he died uh, what he would want to be done with respect to his property, and that is what we call tested succession, tested succession. The other part is where the person had not um, um, made any pronouncements or had not uh, done any will or had not done anything or given any, any indication that is... Uh, known to law, um, and then he dies and his property has to be distributed. We call that intestate succession, intestate succession. Now, with respect to testate succession, where the person had already pronounced himself about what he would want to be done, uh, we have two types of uh, things that can happen. There is something we call a written will, and there's something we call an oral will. Oral wills are not very common in this country because they're usually a bit controversial in the sense that somebody has to, uh, it must be something he said in the presence of, um, of witnesses and he dies within a period of three months. But uh, the more recognized one is what we call a written will. A written will in this case is something that uh, is done by, it's better when it's done by a professional because what we see in most of our practice uh, is that uh, people write, they get a small exercise book, they write some small things. But when they die, we realize that uh, those, um, what they have written may not be able to stand in a court of law in case it is contested because it's not a document that meets the requirements of the law. So it's always advisable that uh, if somebody wants to write a will, 
they get advice from a lawyer or somebody who knows what a will is all about, um, about, who, who, or about um, who, who is competent to write a will, who is supposed to be able to witness the will, how many people are supposed to, um, to be present, who is not qualified. Uh, most people don't know, for instance, that you are not supposed to have uh, the people who are benefiting, like your children, if you are a man, you are not supposed to bring your children and they participate in you writing a will. The will is supposed to be a secret document uh, for obvious reasons to avoid uh, bringing a lot of animosity when you are still alive. Um, and uh, they are, they, 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 they are, they, you could be advised on the number of people who are supposed to be there. There's somebody we call an executor. Um, they, are, they are at least a minimum of two witnesses. Those are the type of things you are not going to know if you do it without the help of a professional. So in this kind of case, I would not want to dwell too much on the issue of a written will, because I think in this kind of setup, it may not be possible to exhaustively advise the audience on what uh, is supposed to be there in a written will. But what I may also need to do before I move away from the issue of the will is that uh, most people assume because you have written a will, uh, the will by itself is just going to be effected automatically. That is not true. If you die and your will is with your lawyer or some other person that you are trusted, that will will still have to be subjected to the legal process. Uh, there is a process we call probate of the will. That will has to be filed in court. Uh, a gazette notice has to issue so that um, in case there is somebody who has an objection towards that will who thinks probably the will is fake or probably they have not been provided for, can be able to challenge that will, notwithstanding you are the one who wrote it. Um, so uh, it's good to, uh, to clear the air that you don't write a will and immediately it is effected because it has now to go through the due process so that um, um, even if we are talking about transfer of land, the, the land registry is not just going to take a will and say, uh, Mr. Kamau had given his children uh, this parcel of land and that parcel of land is going to be effected using just the will. It must come out as some form of a court order after a due process of the law. Now, let us... Uh, come to the issue of intestate succession. Remember, we said intestate succession is the succession where the person had not said anything. He had not pronounced himself um, on what he would want to be done to his property. Now, if that happens and the person comes to my office as a lawyer, what I, would, uh, I advise them is to, to prepare a certain set of, um, of, of requirements that uh, have, to be, um, have to be made available for us to, to kickstart that process. The first thing is that once the person dies, obviously you get a burial permit, and uh, the person, after the person is buried, you will take that, um, that uh, burial permit together with the ID card of, of the deceased person, and you take it to the registrar of births and deaths, uh, you will be issued with a death certificate. The first thing is a death certificate. Once you get the death certificate, you will need to proceed to your local administrator. Most of the times we use the local chiefs, uh, probably in some cases the, what we, are, we have always called the, the DOs, they probably have some other name now, they will issue a certain letter. That letter indicates that the person who died, we, we call the deceased, uh, had uh, hailed from their area of jurisdiction. He had this number of uh, children. If it's a man, the, this is the wife or wives. If it's a, the, the wife who has died, the husband. And um, uh, he'll simply certify that he knows that person is from that area. Now, the chief doesn't have any powers to start now 
are giving uh, their opinions. We usually see sometimes uh, this happening where the chief sort of like get, tries to give an indication on who is supposed to, to inherit what. That is wrong. That is the function of a court of law. Um, the letter from the chief having been acquired, uh, we advise um, the family of the deceased now to go um, and do what we call uh, due process with respect to the property of the deceased person. They try and get uh, copies of the, of the title deeds, if it's land, shares, uh, certificates, probably logbooks of motor vehicles, even to assess the um, uh, probably the, um, uh, the animals and generally movables and immovable property of the deceased person. Because we need to record that when we are uh, starting the process of succession. We need to have a list of dependents. Dependents is a technical term here, but for our purpose, we are talking about people who were relying on the deceased person before he passed on. Um, it may... It, it doesn't necessarily mean uh, the immediate, for instance, children and, uh, and, uh, and spouse. Sometimes it goes beyond uh, to the level of anybody who was uh, dependent on that person. Um, they are listed and most of the time that list is supposed to tally with the list that, that was given and or granted by the chief. Now, with respect to um, uh, property like, uh, like land, we need that um, the title deeds, uh, somebody does an official search so that we don't have a situation whereby people have copies of title deeds that were long sold or probably they have long-term mortgages. Uh, I mean charges, they are charged. Uh, so um, once we get... Um, the full list and to sh uh, showing that the property is a uh, free property is not encumbered in any way. We know now we are set to go with respect to immovable property. Immovable property here means property like land. Um, for purposes of, uh, of uh, motor vehicles, those are movable properties. You may need to do the same so that you don't have a situation whereby you introduce property that is already encumbered. Is the, 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 the motor vehicle, for instance, probably doesn't even belong to the deceased person. You need to confirm. Once you have all the property of the deceased person and it is in one, um, one document and you have the full list of the beneficiaries, you have a death certificate, uh, you have the letter from the chief, now you go to the next step. We tell you the other people who are supposed to be, to be present. You, may, you, you will definitely need two persons, uh, a minimum uh, of two persons who we call guarantors, people who can say what you have said is actually true. We know these people and what they have said in those documents is true. They need to sign something we call a bond. They are merely saying we know uh, that that is true and we would be ready even to forfeit a certain amount in case it was found that we were lying. We need also the family to come up with administrators. Administrators are people who are going to be in charge of the process of succession until the time when the estate is going to be distributed. Most of the time, we usually have uh, two to a maximum of four. But in some cases, we can even have one person as the administrator. An administrator, most of the time, is, uh, is usually part of the people who are, um, are benefiting from the estate. Uh, it's not necessarily a legal requirement because we, are, we have situations whereby uh, we have administrators who are not necessarily uh, benefiting from the estate. Um, we have situations where we have um, institutions like a bank that had a lot of interest in the estate of the deceased person being allowed to come in uh, as, uh, as administrators. Um, I don't want to go into the, uh, into the intricate details of that. We even have stations whereby estates are managed by what we call a public trustee, which is an office under the attorney general, where they can also manage estates of a deceased person. But I, didn't, I do not want to go through that route at this moment. Now, once you have all these documents uh, for purposes of interstate succession, the process that follows from there is that uh, the documents are filed, what we call 
um, a petition for letters of administration. That's like a prayer in simple language. It is filed in court. It can be filed in the lowest court uh, from a magistrate court to the high court, and that is determined by the amount of um, uh, the, 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 the worth well, there's something we call pecuniary jurisdiction and territorial jurisdiction. Territorial jurisdiction means you, you are supposed to file uh, your, your claim in the nearest court possible so that we don't have a situation whereby somebody is filing uh, for succession in Nairobi and the property is in Mandera. That becomes complicated in case there is a dispute and the court would want to visit uh, the scene. It would be very cumbersome for the court to move all the way to Mandera to, uh, to physically see the property. Uh, once now uh, you have identified you are going to file uh, where most of the property is and where the deceased was living, where we, and that's what we call in law domicile. Uh, you file, um, if the, mat the matter is of a little uh, bit of a low amount of worth, you file it in a magistrate court. If it's of a very high uh, value, you go to the high court. Um, magistrate courts have a, up to a maximum of around 20 million. There are different magistrates who have probably less depending on their rank. Once you file um, that, do that document we are calling the petition, um, you will be required to pay a small amount of, of duty. It's basically a nominal amount. And then um, you'll be given a, doc a document that allows you to pay for um, the, the, the claim or the petition to be uh, placed in the, a government newspaper we call the Kenya Gazette. Once the, Kenya Gazette, uh, the, the notice comes out in the Kenya Gazette, it remains for 30 days where nobody can be able to move anyway until the 30 days are over. Once 30 days are over and there is no claim, that's when you go to the next step. If there is somebody who is opposing, then the, the dispute has to be heard first. Um, that is something we call in law an objection. Um, once that objection has been heard, that's when you can go to the next step. If there is no objection, uh, the law requires that um, you follow up until, until you get the first certificate that is issued by the court, and that is what we call a grant of representation. Once you get that grant of representation, that is the first certificate simply um, admitting that uh, the person who was nominated to be an administrator is now recognized by the court, and the people who are proceeding with the process are now recognized by the court. Um, that, from the day you get that particular document, you are supposed to wait for six months, six months you cannot be able to do anything else before the expiry of six months. Now, in certain situations where there, um, there is um, a very major need that has arisen, uh, like uh, some children have been chased away from, uh, from school and uh, there's an urgent need to access probably funds which are uh, in an account of a deceased person, which by the way, the funds are also part of the estate. They are supposed to be indicated. Uh, the court can be able to, um, to give a special uh, permission, um, a, a special order that can be allowed to, uh, you to access limited funds for a specific purpose which will be taken to specifically to that institution. If there is nothing like that and there is no objection within a period of six months, um, the administrator who has now been who, has, who was appointed by the court after gazettement is supposed to make now an application for confirmation of that grant. Remember we have said the, the first document you get is a grant of representation. That grant is what is supposed to be confirmed after a period of six, uh, six months. You cannot apply before then unless there are exceptional circumstances. Now what needs to happen is that the family needs to sit down and agree, including now the administrator and all the dependents, how they would want the property of the deceased person to be distributed. Once they have agreed that this is the route that they want to take, um, they are supposed to put it down in form of a sworn affidavit uh, that is going to be sworn by the administrator. 
and the dependents are supposed to sign a document we call a consent that they have they have given permission that uh, they, and they have agreed that this is the way it's going to be distributed. If it's a parcel of land of ten acres and you want uh, the, for the the five children to get two acres each, whatever it is that they have agreed, they put it down in what we call a schedule of distribution. Uh, once that application has been made, it is given a date by the court. And then the persons who are named there, they need to physically come to court with their ID cards, to, for, for, especially for the ones who are below the age of, uh, above the age of majority. They come and say physically to the judge or magistrate that true, what has been said in that affidavit in support by the administrator is true and that's what we have agreed. If the persons happen to be probably out of the country, they can make a document from out of the country, which is supposed to be stamped by somebody called a notary public in an, that other jurisdiction, and it is sent for them to be given an exemption because sometimes it may not be possible uh, or even economic for persons to fly from all over the world just to come for that particular um, session, which may be a five-minute affair in court. Once the court has given... Uh, uh, it uh, has agreed with the family that uh, they go ahead and distribute the property as they have suggested, the court issues something we call Certificate of Confirmation of Grant. Certificate of Confirmation of Grant. That is the most important document that you'll be asked for in any office, whether it's in the bank, whether it is in the land registry, or the Nairobi Securities Exchange when you want to do transfer of property of a deceased person. That becomes now like the ID card of, of, uh, of the deceased person. And the administrator is the one who's supposed to supervise the, the way that grant is going to be effected. That is a document that will be taken to the lands office. There are several other documents that I don't want us to enter into today, which now will be signed and uh, in conjunction with that document, they'll be taken to the, to the land's office for transfer of property. They'll be taken to the bank for change of account but, uh, or transfer of money. They'll be taken to Nairobi Security of Ex Exchange for purpose, purposes of transfer of the shares. And uh, any other property, that is a document. Now, in the event that there is, there is a, the family recognizes that there is a property that was omitted when making that particular document, they can apply for something we call rectification of grant. Because what happens, especially in our setup, uh, we have seen a situation whereby, um, especially with respect to African men, uh, they, they usually have a lot of hidden property. For whatever reason, you find that uh, the man dies and the wife probably doesn't know a lot of property of the husband. And uh, when they come to a lawyer or uh, they file on their own because it's not a requirement that you, it must be done by a lawyer, when the confirmation is almost being given or it has already been given, they start realizing that there is property of the deceased person that was not included or the deceased person had debts because a process of succession is not just about assets. It's also about liabilities. You need to, set, to, to settle uh, document, uh, the, um, debts that were owed by the deceased person uh, before you can now be able to share what is the net, the net worth of the deceased person. So it's probably very important even at this point to mention that uh, it's, very, um, it, it, it's very tragic what we usually say that uh, once uh, somebody dies and uh, he had not confided in anyone a list of all their spouses about their property. Some, some properties end up getting lost because they were not captured by, uh, in, in, the, in the process of succession and there is no way you are going to get property in your name uh, from the name of a deceased person if it is not through the process of succession. Now, uh, probably before I start winding up, I need to mention something. Once this process is opposed by any member of the family or any other interested party. Now, that the, the, the process that I've explained above ceases to operate. Everything stops. That now becomes a, success, a, a succession dispute. 
Now, different parties, parties, the ones who are pro and the ones who are against, now have to battle it out, of, uh, out in court until the court now gives a, a finding one way or the other. And um, it's good to advise our people that uh, that's where uh, the most tragic thing happens. You find that, uh, um, I'm sure you have seen that in the, in the, in the press, you find that uh, there are some disputes that have been in court even for 40 years. I'm sure there are some recent ones that you have seen in the press and so in social media. It is, it is very sad because a very big chunk of the estate is used up by us lawyers, the courts, and all manner of people who participate in the, in the dispute until the day it will be resolved. So uh, my advice, first of all, would be it would be better even to delay uh, for uh, filing this process if there is some fear of disagreement so that by the time you file, there is a complete consensus in as much as possible. There is a give and take. Uh, there is no way everybody probably might get exactly everything that they would have wanted. But the moment you go through the route of a dispute, um, the truth of the matter is that uh, you could be in court for a very, very long time. And it is probably uh, counterproductive because the property is supposed to be used by you when you are already um, um, uh, energetic. You are enjoying the property of your probably spouse or father or mother. And uh, if you have to battle out for 20 years, 30 years, it may not be as useful as if you had agreed. Um, now, um, as I wind up, uh, one thing, I, something else that I may also uh, need to, uh, to mention is that uh, there are so many laws uh, that somehow interface or they, they have uh, some bit of reference and interaction with the law of succession. And um, so it's not probably very safe to give you an indication that uh, the law of succession operates in a vacuum. It operates in conjunction with several other laws because um, some people may, may probably write wills and the, the wills are found to be, uh, to be unlawful because probably you want to, to bequeath or give property to an, an unlawful organization. That's not going to be allowed even if it's your, in your will. Um, uh, probably somebody may decide uh, that uh, they, they don't like so-and-so. Probably they remarried. And uh, they think that uh, just because they remarried, the first wife is, is not uh, entitled to any property. It's good that uh, I explain that uh, there is, the law has a schedule of who is a dependent, who can be able to, uh, to benefit from the estate. So if, if you do not seek advice and you just uh, let, let out, uh, let, let, uh, leave out some people and uh, they go to court, it will be a, a futile exercise because at the end of the day, the court will recognize them as some of the people who are recognized in a schedule that is clearly um, written in, the, in what we call the Law of Succession Act, uh, Chapter 160 of the Laws of Kenya. So um, as I said uh, from the beginning, this is mostly a general overview. I do not want it to look like uh, it's a legal advice for your specific case. You may need to go and see a lawyer, but now you are wiser. You have a fairly good idea about what to expect and um, so that you remove uh, some of the stories probably you have heard uh, from elsewhere. This is the legal position. But for your specific case, it may be advisable uh, to get uh, legal advice. And uh, I also need to point out that it is not a legal requirement that you must use a lawyer for purposes of succession. Um, there are so many people, in fact, the majority of the people are the ones who do not uh, use lawyers. But you, ca it, you save yourself a lot of heartache if you went to a lawyer simply to be given advice, even if you do not want the lawyer to act for you, at least to, to ensure that uh, the documents that uh, you are filing are the correct documents so that you don't end up working in vain. So I believe uh, probably you have gotten something out of uh, that short uh, overview and um, probably you are much wiser. And uh, thank you for listening.